Hello, uh, welcome to the last lecture for dense matrix multiplication chapter. We learned last time that the blocked matrix multiplication uh, helps reduce the DRM axis uh, because you can reuse the data. And for data reuse, um, you need to store the data in the internal memory, right? Uh, the amount of internal memory usage uh, depends on the loop ordering. Uh, for example, if it is a K, I, J, uh, we learned last time that uh, we need an internal memory of size one uh, for A because the reuse distance is one. And uh, we need an internal memory of size M for B uh, because the reuse distance uh, was M. And uh, in terms of DRAM access order, um, you can access B and C in row direction, you know, the good direction, uh, because it's uh, K, I, J, right? And uh, K, I, J, right? The row direction. Uh, but for A, it was a uh, column direction, the bad direction, because it was a uh, K, I, J. And we implemented the blocked matrix multiplication using HLS slice time. Uh, we found that allowing HLS to automatically optimize the code uh, led to bad performance. So um, we gave some optimization hints uh, to the HLS compiler by manually unrolling the innermost loop and uh, pipelining the outer loop. Uh, it gives a decent amount of parallelism, about M meg operations per cycle and it doesn't consume too much resource, right? And the, the onboard performance uh, was uh, 47 giga ops, uh, which isn't too bad, but uh, isn't too good either uh, because the idea performance using a 256 meg operators uh, was 128 giga ops. Okay, and uh, we found that the reason for the low uh, performance uh, was due to the uh, low effective DRAM bandwidth. So what we're going to do today uh, is apply some DRAM optimizations on our implementation. So uh, this is the uh, overview of the optimization uh, we'll talk about today. Uh, first, uh, we'll increase the effective DRAM bandwidth uh, using a wider bus type and uh, you'll be able to explain why using a transpose matrix will bring performance benefits and uh, uh, will improve the performance uh, with the data flow optimization. The first optimization we're going to apply is uh, using a wide bus data type or the uh, vector bus data type. Um, this optimization is exactly the same as the one we have applied on the Hello World, you know, the uh, vector add project. So um, if you take a look at this uh, top function argument, uh, it is a, a HLS vector of the type and the size. Uh, the D type is a short type and the D size is a, a here a 64 uh, divided by the size of the type. The 64 corresponds to the bus width, you know, 512 bits or 64 bytes and the size of a short is going to be a uh, two bytes. So uh, this size, uh, the, the vector length is going to be 32. Okay. So this means that uh, we're now going to fetch uh, 32 shorts uh, at a time uh, from the axis bus in, in parallel. Okay. And uh, hopefully this will solve for our uh, low effective bandwidth problem. Uh, since we have changed the type of the function argument, uh, we have to change our data read code as well. Um, previously, we fetched only one short data of B per iteration, uh, so the loop length was uh, previously M, the block size. Uh, but now uh, we're fetching D size or uh, 32 shorts at a time, uh, so the loop length is now reduced to M over D size. Okay, so we fetch one vector of B here, and uh, after that, uh, you have to place the data in the B line, the, the internal memory uh, at the appropriate places, uh, this code. Um, this is uh, unrolled uh, because it can be done in parallel, and uh, you also want to pipeline this loop um, to speed up the DRAM access. Um, same thing with the AB write uh, to DRAM. Uh, after the computation, the result uh, exists in the AB block. 
this one. Um, you want to uh, fill a vector of length 32 one at a time and uh, send the data to DRAM here uh, in a pipeline manner. So um, overall, uh, this is just the data uh, copy routine. Uh, it's just that the uh, unit of transfer has changed to 5 bits or 32 shorts at a time. Okay. Now we have changed the B and A, B, DRAM access arguments. Uh, let's take a look at matrix A. Oh well, uh, long story short, uh, we are not going to make any changes to A. Uh, we're going to keep A as a single short and not make it into a vector. Um, why not? Uh, well, suppose we do make A into a vector type as well. Um, then uh, since the loop order is a K, I, J, uh, even if we fetch A11, A12, A13, A14 in a vector, uh, we cannot use A12 right after using A11. Uh, we'll use A21, A31, A41, and then use A12, right? And to use uh, A13, we have to wait, 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 and then use A13. And in the meanwhile, we have to store the vector of the next column, the next one, and the next one uh, in the internal memory. So we'll end up storing a vector of the whole column uh, in the internal memory, which comes to about uh, 32 times m. This is not a very ideal situation. So you can see that uh, using a vector type for A uh, is pretty inefficient uh, in this loop ordering uh, because of the large memory consumption. And uh, that's why for now uh, I just left A as a single element, uh, not a vector. Let's look at the performance numbers after we use a wide bus data type for a B and a B. Uh, the execution time has been reduced to 3.2 milliseconds, uh, which translates to 84 gigaops. And uh, if you compare that with the uh, previous version uh, that just had an explicit pipeline and row, uh, it's about two times faster. The, the main reason for the improvement uh, is due to the DRAM bandwidth optimization uh, with the wide bus type. And uh, you can also see that, that we're pretty close to the ideal performance, uh, but not quite there yet. Um, there is a room for uh, further improvement. For the next optimization, uh, let's talk about uh, matrix A. Uh, there were two problems related to uh, matrix A. Uh, first, uh, if the loop order was a KIJ, uh, we have to access A in the column direction. And uh, second, uh, fetching A in a vector was inefficient uh, because a vector of row elements uh, will not be immediately used. Uh, so the internal memory for A uh, became too large. So uh, to solve these two problems, uh, the optimization idea is to uh, simply uh, transpose matrix A. Uh, that's it. So the benefit of uh, transposing matrix A is that number one, uh, we can fetch data in a consecutive address. So if you take a look at this diagram, uh, the A has been now uh, transposed. Uh, so when the loop order is uh, K, I, J, uh, the access order is now going to be in the uh, row direction. Right, uh, and the benefit number two is that uh, we do not need to uh, need a large internal memory, even if we use a vector type for A. So um, uh, A to one gets accessed after A one one. So so we don't need to uh, store like a multiple rows at a time. Right. So you can see that the both benefits uh, will bring a higher effective bandwidth. Uh, but of course, um, this means that the input data layout has to change. So uh, let's modify the matrix A data copy and the computation routines uh, in the host test bench file. So for example, um, the software computation inside the block is now going to change like this. So instead of uh, indexing A uh, by I times M plus K, uh, we now have to index it as a K times M plus I. 
right? Because I and K has been uh, have been uh, now transposed. Uh, next, you have to change the kernel file. Uh, the first thing you should do is to transpose the data copy address uh, index from the uh, i times m plus k to uh, k times m plus i. And the uh, second thing is to uh, change the argument type from the short type to a vector of short type. I remember that the uh, kij loop order will access a transposed A matrix in, a, in the uh, row direction. Okay. And the third uh, change is optional. Uh, you probably want to copy a line of AT into the uh, internal memory. So um, rather than managing 32 shorts at a time, uh, your code usually becomes simpler if you copy the whole line here and access one element at a time uh, here. It's not required, uh, it's just for uh, simpler coding. Okay. The execution time after using a transpose matrix A is uh, 2.7 milliseconds, uh, which is 99 giga ops. Uh, the performance has been improved uh, because we're fetching A faster than before. Uh, so we're almost there. Um, by the way, um, one thing you should keep in mind, um, if the input matrix has not been already transposed, uh, the DM data layout has to be modified uh, before applying this optimization, and this will incur overhead. So what I mean is that the, uh, if a kernel that is processing the data before the matrix location can provide uh, a transposed matrix A, uh, we're in a great shape. Uh, you can apply this optimization without any cost. But um, if the previous kernel cannot provide a transposed matrix uh, for A, uh, you need a separate kernel uh, that transposes the, the data layout and this data re rearrangement uh, is probably more expensive than the benefit you get from using a transposed matrix. So um, for the example of a uh, CNN, uh, I've already explained to you that the, uh, we can use the dense matrix multiplication for the uh, fully connected layers, right? Uh, and uh, applying this uh, transposed matrix A optimization only makes sense if the uh, previous layer uh, can uh, pro pro provide the input in a transposed way. The last optimization will be the data flow optimization. Uh, for the uh, Hello World vector add project, uh, I have explained that the uh, Vitus HLS uh, can overlap the computation and the memory access, but uh, it's not that perfect. So HLS uh, has some difficulty uh, overlapping matrix A uh, and the B data copy uh, with the computation part. So um, it helps a lot uh, if we apply the data flow optimization uh, for the HLS compiler. And uh, we have already learned how to apply the data flow optimization uh, in this lecture. So uh, let's try that on, on the uh, matrix multiplication as well. I'll show how to change the top function. Uh, first, you need to place the uh, HLS data flow pragma. Uh, and then we want to separate the data copy routines uh, into individual functions. So previously, uh, reading A and B uh, was in the same function as the computation part. Uh, but since we want uh, overlapping, uh, you want to separate them into different functions uh, and instantiate them in the top function. Uh, then uh, they will run in parallel. And uh, you probably remember that the uh, communication between the data flow functions uh, should be in uh, HLS streams, uh, which are going to be synthesized into FIFOs. Okay, uh, I don't think I need to show you the uh, how to make the uh, read A or read B and the write A, B functions. Uh, you just need to separate the data copy routines. Um, there is one new function that uh, you have not seen before. It's a change A rate function. Uh, this is optional, uh, but let's uh, see what this is in, in the uh, next slide. 
the purpose of the change a rate function is to change matrix a vector type to single element. So um, if you go a few slides back, um, we are processing a line of B in parallel, uh, but uses only a single element of A to be multiplied with the whole line. So even if we are fetching a vector of A, uh, we only need to pass an element of A to the computation unit uh, one at a time. So uh, that's, that's what this is doing, uh, receiving a vector and sending one element at a time. Well, of course, uh, you could do this operation in the read a function or the uh, compute function, uh, but you'll find it that the data rate change circuit becomes a lot simpler uh, if you separate it into a separate function. So again, not required, uh, but simply optional. So for the exercise, uh, please implement the rest of the function uh, for the data flow optimized dense matrix multiplication. Uh, this is actually given as a homework in my class. Um, I have already shown you the major parts of the code in the previous optimizations, and uh, you just need to make a few minor changes to separate the functions. This is the uh, performance after applying the data flow optimization. Uh, the execution time is further reduced to 2.38 milliseconds, uh, which is 113 giga ops. Um, the, the improvement uh, is due to the uh, better overlapping of the computation and the memory access parts. Now, uh, this is still slightly smaller than the ideal performance, uh, but frankly, uh, you cannot uh, exactly reach the ideal performance uh, because you know uh, uh, blocks first data read A and B routines are not overlapped with any computation and the last A B data write routine uh, is also not overlapped with any computation so the uh, epilogue and the prologue of the function level pipeline will always be there and uh, this will stop you from reaching a zero overhead but still, uh, you'll probably agree that uh, we're pretty close um, and the performance is about uh, 2,300 times faster uh, than the uh, baseline uh, implementation uh, that did not have any uh, HLS specific optimization. So this is a well optimized version for uh, 256 MAG operators. Um, of course, you can improve the performance by adding more bags. Um, F1 has uh, 6,000 DSPs, so you could try to enlarge it to like a 2048 or 4096 MAG operators. Uh, but if you do try to generate a couple thousand MAG version, uh, your design will probably uh, fail to place and route. The reason is that the data distribution from AXIC controllers to PEs that the MAG unit uh, becomes too complicated when the number of PE is large. Um, this results in a large drop in the clock frequency. So uh, how do we solve this problem? Uh, the most common way of implementing a large matrix multiplication accelerator uh, is to use something called the systolic arrays. A systolic array architecture uh, looks something like this. Uh, there is an array of PEs and the PE1 is connected to PE2, PE2 is connected to PE3, and so on. And each PE uh, passes the data to neighbors only and uh, the data is passed in a rhythmical way, uh, you know, like the heartbeat. So it's a doom, 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 right? right? And uh, that's why it's called a systolic array. Um, there is uh, no uh, global control logic uh, that controls the, the data passing. So you can imagine that, that this is going to bring a lot of uh, clock frequency improvement uh, because there is no global data distribution logic and the connections are mostly local. Okay, so uh, you see that this architecture being mentioned a lot. Uh, the most famous one would be the Google TPU, uh, which is in a 2D systolic array. So this is really a proven architecture. We are not going to implement the systolic array in this class. Uh, let me just give you two references. 
Uh, the diagram uh, we just saw in the last slide uh, is from the first paper. Uh, explains uh, how to implement the uh, uh, one D systolic array for the matrix multiplication. Uh, the second paper uh, explains how to optimize systolic array designs uh, by doing a design-based exploration of the different parameters. So uh, um, systolic array architecture uh, may be in like a 1D, 2D. Uh, the data may come from uh, just few points or the whole boundary, uh, or the uh, resource constraint uh, will also like uh, differ based on the uh, FPGA platform. So uh, this paper discusses uh, how to extract the optimal design uh, based on these uh, multiple constraints. So um, you're welcome to read these papers uh, if you're interested in building high performance matrix multiplication accelerator uh, for your research. So let's uh, wrap up our discussion on the matrix multiplication optimization. Uh, as a summary for today's lecture, uh, we learned that uh, we should visualize a wide or vector bus data type to increase the effective theorem bandwidth. And we also learned that the, depending on the loop order, uh, using a transposed matrix for A uh, could improve the effective theorem bandwidth. Also, we saw that the uh, computation and memory access is better overlapped after applying the data flow optimization and the systolic array architecture uh, improves the frequency when using a large amount of PEs. Uh, so it's okay to like stop at up to this point if you have to just implement the 256 PEs, but you definitely want to consider the systolic array architecture uh, when you aim for thousands of PEs. All right, so that's it for today. Um, actually, uh, this will probably be the uh, last recording for this summer. Uh, I'll post some more at the uh, end of the uh, next semester. And uh, I realized that uh, some people were asking for my slides. Well, well, why not? So um, I'll post my notes in my website uh, sometime later and uh, put the link below. Okay, so. Um, so long for now and uh, good luck with your class and research and uh, I hope to meet you next time. Bye now.